Okay, so um, first, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, echo Tanya's um, gratitude for, for organizing this, Avery. Um, I think it's an absolutely wonderful idea um, in this very strange time that we're living in right now when all of our in-person conferences uh, have been canceled and, and we aren't able to, to see all of our friends and colleagues and, and talk about great science and you know things like the, the trip to Russia that, that all of the hypervalent iodine community was going to be making this summer that I was particularly excited about got canceled and, and uh, you know, at least postponed to next year. Um, so I'm really grateful for a chance to, to get to share my science with you today. Um, trying to move the uh, strange Zoom bar out of the way so that I can see what I'm talking about. Great. Um, and uh, so thank you all for tuning in and uh, thank you, Tanya, for, for a wonderful first talk. Um, I absolutely love all of her chemistry and, and we work in, in some very related problems. And so we spend a lot of time in, in her papers. I always feel like I learned something during one of her talks. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is some of the more recent chemistry that uh, my group has been working in. So I'll first give you sort of a little bit of an introduction to the overall themes of my lab. Um, and then uh, really dive in deep on, on one of our unpublished stories that, that hopefully will be published here um, in the next, uh, next couple of weeks. All right, so as you can see here on my screen, um, my group uh, works largely in the development of novel umpalong strategies for the synthesis of organic molecules. And uh, that's sort of the thread that ties it all together. And I'll talk a little bit about what umpalong means on the next slide, um, but really the the enabling reagents that we work with to, to do these transformations are these nitrogen ligated hypervalent iodine compounds. Um, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about our, our efforts in the reagent development and then dive deeply into one of the stories of the chemistry that we're working on right now. Okay, so umpalung reactivity, which some of you or many of you may be familiar with, um, just refers to a reverse polarity process where essentially you exchange the reactivity of nucleophilic centers to become electrophilic or electrophilic to become nucleophilic. Um, and in particular, the chemistry that I'm going to talk about today uh, relating to hypervalent iodine involves taking nucleophilic centers and making them electrophilic. And so in a practical sense, uh, what that means in terms of, of some functionalities and in retrosynthetic disconnections. So you could think about um, a cyclic ether bond, so this carbon oxygen bond where you would uh, traditionally think about forming that via an SN2 reaction of an alkoxide into a carbocation. But instead via an umpalung, you would generate an electrophilic oxygen species and do a nucleophilic cyclization onto that center. For enolate chemistry, you would disconnect at the alpha position rather than via traditional enolate alkylation, instead via nucleophilic attack at a uh, now electrophilic alpha carbon. And then finally, uh, when you think about just traditional unactivated alkenes, uh, rather than the, the sort of nucleophilic and electrophilic centers, you would uh, then do something like an oxidative difunctionalization of an alkene where both centers are rendered electrophilic. And what we really like about thinking about chemistry this way is, you know, when you teach organic chemistry to sophomores, sort of the underpinning principle that um, you teach them to work their way through mechanisms is first identify the nucleophile and the electrophile. That's sort of the fun foundations of their understanding of the chemistry. And so if you then think about designing reactions with the exact opposite reactivity, it really sets you up to be very creative and very innovative in the types of transformations that you're thinking about. So it enables novel disconnections and new functionalization patterns beyond what is traditionally accessible. And so broadly speaking, we think of this reversal of polarity as enable sort of enabling sort of a reversal of strategy and how we think about putting together molecules. Now, um, in order to do this type of reactivity, you of course need some sort of tool. And uh, this being a hypervalent iodine conference, you will not be surprised that our tools are hypervalent iodine reagents. Uh, so here's some of the uh, introduction to hypervalent iodine that Tanya promised you that I would be doing. Um, so very briefly, what I've shown you here is, um, you know, the various oxidation states of iodine that we are familiar with seeing. Uh, so most commonly, you know, iodobenzene in the I1 is the most stable oxidation state, but then of course you can access the I3 or the I5 oxidation states as well. So Primarily, my group has focused uh, on the I3 oxidation state as they have quite diverse reactivity. 
Um, we've dabbled recently in the I-5 as well, and I'll, I'll touch on those, um, those compounds uh, very briefly and some of the reactivity we've explored. So the, the main type of reaction that I want to focus on and develop a little bit more for you um, is this hypernucleofugality that's inherent to the I3 compounds and very enabling for umbolone reactivity. So hypernucleofugality is a mouthful, and I won't say it too many times during this talk, but um, essentially it just means that it's an outstanding leaving group uh, with leaving group abilities about 10 to the six times greater than that uh, of a triplate as, as sort of quantified by Ochai in the mid 1990s. So mechanistically, how that reactivity typically works is you go undergo initial ligand exchange at the iodine center with an external nucleophile to generate this non-symmetrical iodine I3 intermediate. And that can have several different fates. Um, it can undergo reductive elimination and, and, or ligand coupling reactions, or it can undergo the reactivity we're going to focus on. Um, it can undergo umpalung attack on what was previous your, previously your nucleophile with an external Y species to now generate this Y nucleophile bond. But all of this reactivity, whether it be the reductive elimination or the umpalung, is driven by the return of iodine to its normal valency. So that thermodynamic driving force is what generates this hypernucleofugality that's highly enabling um, in using these, reactions, these reagents as electrophilic activators. So this type of umpalung reactivity um, is well known in the literature for hypervalent iodine. So two examples uh, I pulled to show here uh, are a Hoffman rearrangement, uh, where the nitrogen centered is, ren is rendered electrophilic, uh, or the alpha oxidation of carbonyl compounds, which undergoes a nucleophilic attack at the alpha carbon via this enolonium type species. Okay, so with that sort of preface and the basic type of reactivity, I wanna just sort of introduce our work in this area with one of the first problems that my group worked on. So one of the first proposals in my lab was uh, this sort of umpalung CO activation. So we wanted to generate these medium ring cyclic ethers via the activation of this oxygen, of the oxygen center of an alcohol. These are ubiquitous functional handles and wouldn't it be great if we could directly transform them into these challenging medium ring uh, systems. So we envisioned doing that uh, by activating with a hypervalent iodine reagent, analogous to the Kriege rearrangement of alkyl peroxides to generate this electrophilic oxygen with loss of iodo, um, iodobenzene upon rearrangement. And when we started doing our initial screening, this is first a tale of failure in that we were not super familiar with hypervalent iodine um, reagents. I had not done a lot of work in this field previously. And so we started just as anyone would have started and we bought as many things as we could or things that were readily um, accessible or that we were familiar with. And all of the typical um, I3 species that we found with X species such as carboxylates or halogens or tosylates all failed and didn't generate any of the desired product. And so we were getting a little bit desperate. This was in my first year or two as a professor. And um, so we moved, we started asking ourselves, the iodine center is probably not electrophilic enough, not electron deficient enough in order to um, pull enough electron density off of this oxygen. And so could we generate a more electrophilic iodine center by expanding the scope of X ligands that we were, we were looking at? And at that time, um, we found a report by Weiss uh, in Angevant in 1994 and a subsequent, um, some subsequent calculations by Jason Dutton in 2012, looking at the effect of X ligands on the iodine center. So in acetate, uh, in PETA as shown here, you can see the IO bond lengths and molecule charge and bond association energies. And these are typical of the type of species that we were looking at initially. But the report from Weiss uh, looked at the electrostatic activation of hypervalent iodine reagents by including these uh, datively bound nitrogen heterocyclic ligands. And you can see here that the bond length has increased. We've had an increase of charge on the iodine center and significantly our bond association energy has gone down by over half. And so with this sort of uh, intriguing finding, we were wondering if these reagents were the key to maybe enabling our reactivity. And to cut a very long story short, and I won't talk about this chemistry in detail today, um, these reagents were extremely enabling. So they were the only class of compounds to do the oxidative rearrangement we were in search of. And we've applied this now to tertiary alcohols, to secondary alcohols, and done some late stage derivatization of natural products as well. Um, 
So that's all to say that this is the chemistry that got us intrigued by um, these nitrogen ligated HBI compounds and took my chemistry largely in that direction since this initial discovery. So a little bit of background on the NHBI. So we've done a lot of, spent a lot of time playing around with these compounds and learned a lot about their reactivity and their synthesis. Um, so as I mentioned, they were first reported by Weiss uh, in 1994, uh, and they're synthesized very simply by activation of commercially available PETA with the silyl triflate in the presence of your nitrogen heterocycle, and initially uh, just done in DCM. And your NHVI crashes out as a white free-flowing solid that you can isolate via filtration. Um, now, every, but one of the only one of the first questions I always get when I give one of these talks is, how easy are these things to make? How easy are they to handle? Uh, are they sensitive? And I can tell you that they are a little bit moisture sensitive. Uh, so it depends on the X ligand. It depends on the weather conditions. Um, today in Philadelphia would be a terrible time to work with these compounds. It's incredibly hot and humid. Um, but to try to educate everybody and bring everybody onto the same page, we recently submitted an org sin for how to make two analogs of these uh, NHVIs. So that's waiting to be checked by an external reviewer uh, once the labs in the United States are fully operational again. Um, but a key discovery we've made is that actually making them in ether rather than DCM can be uh, really improve the stability, um, the longevity on the bench, uh, and the ease of isolation of a lot of these compounds. All right, so with that being said, you know, the, the four compounds I've shown you here are what Weiss originally reported. Since that time, um, Ritter did a little bit of work with high valent palladium complexes and, and found these uh, two derivatives shown in red. And then this is a small sampling of the greater than 30 uh, different analogs that, that my group has worked with since we've been developing our chemistry. So we have a growing library of different NHVIs. And um, with that, we have ongoing efforts to, to better understand their reactivity, the nature of the IM bond, how covalent is it, how dative is it, depending on the ligand, looking at redox potentials as a function of ligand, and looking into some other um, other reactivity based on, on datively bound nitrogen ligands. Um, so at the time we started working in this area, there was only six reported synthetic applications. Um, oops, not the next slide I thought I had. Uh, and so my group has contributed to this and continues to, get to raise this number. And we really hope that, that these reagents become really ubiquitous, useful um, toolbox for synthetic chemists uh, in the coming years. All right, so before I get into my main story, I also wanted to touch on our work in the I5 oxidation state. So I think I saw that Professor Zdenkin was, was tuning in, and so he gets a, a really big shout out uh, initially as being the first one to report this bipyridine ligated I5 compound that we've come to term the, the bi NHBIs just to fit into our sort of colloquial nomenclature. We're now in the I5 oxidation state. You can have these bidentate ligands and Similar to uh, what we've seen in the I3 oxidation state, uh, they have increased reactivity relative to your typical ZMP or IBX type reagents. They have improved solubility in organic solvents. So there's much less, they're not as polymeric as say IBX. Um, and excitingly, they have improved safety profiles as well. So we've generated a small library of these compounds and done some TGA studies. And you can see that relative to IBX or this bisacetate precursor, you want this nice gradual slope in a TGA to show that it's not losing its mass all at once upon heating, it's a gradual decomposition, also known as not exploding. Um, and so that's a liability of I5 species, and we found that these bidentate uh, NHBI compounds are much more stable and, and much less prone to explosion. So we're hoping that this is going to have some broad application in oxidation chemistry for the field. We've reported one um, We've done, uh, published one paper on their reactivity so far on the de-aromatization of electron poor phenols to the corresponding orthoquinones directly. We have over 30 examples in this paper. The chemistry works extremely well with this in situ generated by NHBI. And this is just an example of some of the type of compounds that we were able to make using our chemistry. Uh, so this is the Angevin paper we published last year, but we also have an invited syntax submission on this de-aromatization that hopefully will be going out soon. And we're also preparing a, a JOC manuscript where we profile the reactivity more broadly, and we look at just their reactivity across standard oxidation um, reactions. So keep an eye out for those in the, in the coming months. 
All right, so um, this is the sort of my, my obligatory assistant professor overview slide of everything my group sort of dabbles in and works on. And I'm certainly not gonna talk about um, much of this today as, as we're limited for time. Um, but simply to say that, you know, we started over here in Oompa Loompa heteroatom activation. This is what got us interested in NHBIs doing its ring expansion chemistry. And we have continued applications of that chemistry in total synthesis and late stage natural product derivatization. We've looked in, we're moving into some other Oompa Loompa CO bond forming reactions um, in making these um, chromane type scaffolds uh, in, a, in a cascade cyclization. More recently, we've moved to look at olefin activation, and the story that I want to focus on for you today is actually down here at the bottom, and this is some unpublished work um, that hopefully, again, will be coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, COVID-19 has me saying that phrase quite a lot more frequently than I had hoped to at this stage. Um, but the synthesis of these sort of pyridinium salts is the, the chemistry I want to talk to you about today. And so what we've termed for this, this chemistry is heterocyclic group transfer reagents. So basically using NHBIs to now, rather than relying on these nitrogen ligands to just tune reactivity, instead use them to actually transfer their heterocyclic ligands onto organic, organic molecules. And what sort of downstream transformations does that enable? So all of this work is the product of uh, two brilliantly talented postdocs in my group, uh, Dr. Anthony Tierno, who's now at Towson doing his independent career, as well as Dr. Zhao Zhao, who will be leaving us uh, for an independent position in September. And then two graduate students, Jennifer Walters, who has since graduated and is doing a postdoc in the McGee lab, and then um, Andres Vasquez Lopez, who's the current lead on the project. He's just a second year in my group right now. Alrighty, so pyridinium salts. Why do we want to make them? Why do we care about them? Well, uh, they're sort of ubiquitous. We weren't that familiar with, with pyridinium salts when we started in this area. Um, and they're ubiquitous across multiple fields. They're present in ionic liquids as solvents and materials. Uh, there are several natural products that contain pyridinium salts. There's work with antibacterials and different sort of soaps, quaternary ammonium compounds that contain pyridiniums as well. And they also play a role as cellular cofactors. So the NAD, NADH redox couple is actually just a pyridinium dihydropyridine um, species. And then in the realm of more pure organic synthesis, pyridinium salts serve as precursors um, in both some really old, uh, long-standing chemistry as well as some emerging fields as well. So to start over here on the left, you know, pyridinium salts, there's a lot, there's a huge rich body of literature both uh, over the last you know, 50, 75 years, as well as emerging technologies for functionalizing these compounds down to lower oxidation state, saturated nitrogen heterocycles. And as uh, anyone who's familiar with, with medicinal chemistry could imagine, these are incredibly valuable um, types of scaffolds and motifs to be able to access in a diverse, diversity oriented fashion, as piperidines are the most common nitrogen heterocycles found in FDA approved drugs. And when you think about using pyridine as a precursor, rather than just simply coming in with your substituted pyridine, uh, piperidine, excuse me, it could have some real advantages, right? So just doing a simple SciFinder search, there's almost three times as many commercially available pyridines as there are corresponding piperidines, as it's much easier to functionalize around the aromatic ring uh, than the piperidine. And there's a lot of analogs and substitution patterns that are either much cheaper or simply not even available at the level of the piperidine. So if you could start from the pyridine, you would bring that functionality in and then subsequently derivatize. Um, more recently, these pyridinium salts have emerged as radical precursors or radical reservoirs for cross-coupling um, technologies, either through photocatalysis or photoredox or with nickel catalysis from Mary Watson. And what we thought about in this area was this 246 triphenyl pyridinium is essentially the go-to scaffold for this type of chemistry. Uh, but that's sort of derivative of a couple different factors. It's hard to really pinpoint, and I'll talk on the next slide a little bit, but to sum up, there's limited SIR. People haven't really just explored other scaffolds that, that much. There's pretty low atom economy when you look at this as a precursor to just a carbon-centered radical. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of ways you can think about introducing these scaffolds into organic molecules. And so we thought there was some room for innovation to further enable this powerful uh, emerging technology. 
All right, so how do you make pyridinium salts currently? Well, the current synthetic strategies um, are, are really shown here. These are the three most common by far. So you can either do oxoperillium condensations with an amine, um, and this would access through your, your classic Katritsky salts that I was just discussing. So this takes commercially available oxoperillium, which limits your structural um, diversity right there, and condenses it with an existing amine in your scaffold. So this is the source of the radicals used for Suzuki, Nagishi couplings, as well as emerging photoredox catalysis as well, to, do, to use amines as cross-coupling handles. And while this chemistry is extremely powerful, as I said, it is limited by needing an amine, and is this the best functional handle to um, serve as a radical precursor? That isn't really known yet. Then looking down here at the Zinke reaction, uh, this is a classical reaction where you generate this activated aryl pyridinium salt through SNAR and then do sort of a pyridinium exchange with a primary amine. Now this chemistry I don't think has been used as widely as it, as it could have been partially due to some um, harsh reaction conditions that are commonly required. I'll hi highlight the Marizano group's efforts from the mid 90s where they use these scaffolds extensively in total synthesis and for the synthesis of chiral piperidines. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's a lot of promise in this chemistry, but perhaps it's been underutilized uh, to date due to, again, the harsh reaction conditions. And then finally, simple nucleophilic substitution or SN2, but this is extremely forcing as the pyridine is not the best nucleophile uh, and you're very limited by the type of pyridine scaffold you can bring in, as by the, the parameters you'd expect from an SN2 process. So really what we viewed in my group was that they were valuable synthetic handles, but methods for accessing the diverse scaffolds were still pretty limited, and introducing pyridinium salt, say, late stage into a complex molecule is not something you'd really think about doing um, in a synthetic strategy. All right, so Really, our idea was simple in trying to translate the reactivity of PETA, which, can trans, which is an analogous I3 species, which could transfer its X ligands onto organic molecules with the motifs shown here uh, as examples. And could we translate that to NHVIs and transfer now pyridinium salts onto all those same positions using similar reactivity? And we're pursuing a lot of different avenues in this area, uh, but the story I'll tell you is the first one and the one that's essentially reached completion and that's on this sort of amino lactinization of olefins. Now we picked this to start first partially uh, because it's a great proving ground for olefin activation with hypervalent iodine compounds, but also because this motif maps on well to a variety of bioactive molecules, either small molecules or natural products. There's been some beautiful work recently in metal catalyzed uh, amino lactinization, amino, um, lactinization of olefins uh, from both the Lee group and Chu Wang's group at Duke. And while this chemistry is, is extremely efficient and accesses a wide range of, of functionality, it again is limited by either needing to make this um, oxidized uh, hydroxylamine precursor or simply by the availability of the piperidine scaffold. So while we aren't trying to replace or, or supersede this chemistry, we're trying to complement the types of motifs uh, that you might be able to access through the corresponding pyridinium. So mechanistically, very simply, this is what we were envisioning happening. And uh, initial olefin activation uh, goes via then a 5-exo ring opening with the carboxylate, generating this hypernucleofuge iodonium type species, which could then undergo SN2 uh, to lose the aryl iodide and generate our desired lactone. <clears throat> so our initial test reaction in one of those uh, rare moments in organic synthesis led to near quantitative yield of this desired pyridinium salt in just uh, about 15, 20 minutes at room temperature. And what was really beautiful was that uh, we could just simply triturate these solids out using ether. There was no need for column chromatography um, and it generated an analytically pure NMR. Uh, so this was really, really exciting. So with minimal need for, for further optimization at that moment, we turned our attention to generating a more simplified procedure where you wouldn't need to isolate your HVI first. So we generated an in situ prep where you just sort of sequentially add all of your reagents and uh, you get to the essentially the exact same product and the exact same yield, um, which now allows us to incorporate a broader range of ligands and um, cuts down one step in, in the preparation. Some simple control reactions quickly showed us that their NHBIs were critical to this process. So 
using other halogen-based activators such as NBS or NIS for iota or bromolactinizations in the presence of pyridine did not lead to any of our desired products, simply the bromo or iota lactones in low yields. And then using PETA or PIFA in the presence of pyridine also did not give us our desired pyridinium product, but rather the um, dioxygenation product, again, in low yield under the conditions that we use. So that was pretty exciting. We decided to start to look at the scope a little bit. And essentially, almost anything that we've thrown at this chemistry works extremely well. So we can tolerate ortho substitution quite well. Obviously, this 2,6 disubstituted lutidine compound went in low yield, and I'll come back to that um, in just a minute. We then started looking at some of the substitution patterns that were challenging for corresponding piperidines. And I've just shown here for comparison, um, if you wanted the piperidine with the substitution pattern, what it would cost you or if it would be accessible at all. But you could access those subsequently from this, from this method. We can look at multiple, we can tolerate multiple nitrogen substitution as well as functional handles for downstream um, derivatization. A variety of four substitution, both electron poor and electron rich works well. We can do fused ring systems, the quinolins and the isoquinolins um, are both incorporated efficiently. And really the only time that the chemistry stumbled was when we got pretty aggressive and tried to use these uh, amino acid derivatives. And, and at this stage, we thought these likely weren't working because of incompatibility with actually making the HDI. The presence of these um, amine functionalities has proven to be a problem for us in the past. And so we thought, um, could we come back to this 2,6-lutidine example that had low yield, and could we actually now use this to our advantage um, to serve as, as sort of an activator um, form the NHVI with this compound and then just use these as our nucleophilic component? So the system we envisioned was to use the 2,6-lutidine NHVI to generate this um, iodonium lactone, where now the ligand that we used on the reagent is not nucleophilic, and it, with one equivalent of our precious or incompatible nitrogen heterocycle, get to our desired products. And in fact, this works extremely well. So we can generate the 2,6-lutidine HVI in situ, then add our alkenoic acid and our protected amino acid in just one equivalent now. And we get to um, high or, or quite respectable yields of the corresponding amino acid-derived pyridinium salts, um, whereas before we saw absolutely no conversion. So we think this is really powerful for maybe some more designer heterocycles or, or fun sensitive functionalities that you may want to incorporate. Um, so briefly, I won't, I won't harp on this. We've also looked at the lactone scope and we don't need that gem diphenyl substitution. Um, we can go all the way down to the methylene. It works just fine. We can make medium sized rings and, and benzyl fuse systems work, work quite well also. So gen, the, the chemistry is extremely tolerant of, of essentially anything you want to throw at it. All right, so, so briefly to touch on the mechanistic studies that we've done so far. So you can imagine this chemistry going by a couple different pathways. What we proposed was this initial olefin activation followed by SN2 displacement of this sort of um, alkyl aryl iodonium salt. But you could also imagine that the triflate counterion could do the initial displacement and then the pyridinium could displace the triflate. Or as with our earlier studies where we saw heteroatom activation, perhaps we would get activation of the oxygen center followed by umpalung cyclization of the alkene onto the oxygen and then attack of the pyridinium into the resulting carbocation. So with these in mind, we first uh, wanted to rule out the oxygen activation and we did that uh, by generating the methyl ester, which would be much less likely to go via this pathway. And we saw essentially no change in conversion or yield. So we thought that um, rather uh, made this pathway extremely unlikely. So then turning our attention to A versus B, uh, we needed to rule, it, rule out triplate displacement. And essentially we forced the formation of this uh, lactone triflate compound by using the ditriflate HBI and then added in our four cy cyanopyridine. And in fact, we saw almost, we saw very low conversion, albeit some, to the desired pyridinium salt Whereas with our standard conditions, we get um, an extremely high ratio of pyridinium to, to triflate incorporation. So we thought that this result is, is pretty represented, uh, shows pretty clearly that this is not the dominant pathway to get to the type of ratios that we're seeing for our chemistry. All right, so lastly, 
Uh, I just want to touch on pyridinium derivatizations that we've done so far. So these are alkyl pyridinium salts, and there's a lot of literature out there for the utilization of pyridinium salts for uh, making other nitrogen heterocycles, but many of them are acyl or uh, more activated pyridinium. So these alkyl species are, are less understood. Uh, and what we found so far is, you know, we can do a lot of partial reductions to access these sort of um, interesting um, desaturated piperidine scaffolds. Uh, we can do full reductions down to the fully uh, saturated piperidines. We can make uh, pyridones and we can also do nucleophile additions selectively into the two position to access these sort of um, dienes that can then be subsequently used for, for cyclo additions and, and further derivatizations as well. And some work that's ongoing in the group is applying our chemistry to a formal synthesis of indinavir, um, as you can trace this, uh, the central core back to just the simple chiral um, alkenoic acid and uh, pyrazine. And so this is, this is reaching completion in the group as, as well. Okay, so that wraps up the chemistry, the story I wanted to tell you today. Um, generally, you know, my group worked in these umpalong, um chemistry, and right now the tools that have, have served us really extremely well are these nitrogen ligated HBIs. Um, the chemistry I talk the most about is, is unpublished work and, and something that you should be seeing in the literature in the next couple of, of weeks or months is this heterocyclic, our first report on heterocyclic group transfer chemistry using HBIs and that as a platform for diverse um, cyclic amine synthesis. All right, so uh, that just leaves me to, to thank the people who actually did the work. This is a slightly outdated group picture, but I don't think everyone in my group has been in the same place to take a picture in quite some time, thanks to the pandemic. Um, but the chemistry I focused on largely today was, as I mentioned already, the, group, the work of two postdocs, Dr. Tierno and Dr. Zhao, as well as Jennifer Walters, my first PhD student, and now um, leading the charge is Andres, my, my current graduate student, who's, I guess, entering his third year now. I can't keep track anymore. Um, I work with a great team of other researchers who are driving ahead all the, all the other chemistry going on in the group, and I want to be sure to thank our funding agencies. Uh, we've been very, we're very grateful for their support, the NIH and the NSF. Um, Zoom for making this conference possible, uh, as well as, as Graham and his entire group for, for organizing today. And then finally, I'll thank my daughter, Adeline, uh, who can be credited throughout the talk as manuscript in preparation, as uh, the last three months at home with her um, have been wonderful, but not particularly productive in the manuscript writing uh, category, as, as one might have hoped. But, She's pretty cute, so I'll, I'll take the hit in productivity for the, the three months at home with her. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and then thank you all for tuning in. This was a, a really wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for the, the wonderful presentation. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Zoom. Um, one of our previous postdocs, Leanne, um, is asking, are there opportunities to perform the pyridinium reaction in antio selectively, say using the chiral iodines uh, developed by Fujita? Yes, that's an excellent question and one that my group has thought a lot about. So there's sort of twofold uh, uh, parts of that answer. And the first is we certainly hope so. And it's something that uh, I have people in the group looking at right now. I would say the main and we have every reason to think that it would be possible, especially thinking about the, the heterocyclic group transfer chemistry. In our early ring expansion um, work, we didn't really see a, a clear application for an enantioselective process, and so we didn't investigate that too much. But with the alkene activation, we think it's a lot more promising. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. I guess the main limitation we have at the moment is our ability to, to generate that species catalytically. So right now, we're sort of limited by the synthetic protocols we have to make the HVIs themselves, uh, in that turning them over in situ, which would allow you to use a catalytic amount of a chiral iodine scaffold, is not something we can currently do. So that's sort of a second vein of investigation that we're pursuing in order to make a, a chiral variant um, really actually uh, broadly applicable. Yeah, that was, you, you answered my question. <laughs> I was wondering if, it, if you could turn it over somehow. Um, yes, yeah, so the main challenge there is that sort of activated intermediate that you go through, whether it's the bis triplate or sort of the cationic um, mono um, acetate ligated compound that I showed um, that Shafir has, 
has found is that that species is incredibly reactive. Um, in fact, more reactive than the resulting NHBI. And so that sort of hijacks your reactivity if you generate that in situ. Um, and so we're looking at sort of different intermediates, but that's not been that fruitful. And now we're sort of exploring other modes of activation, other oxidants. Um, and we think we have a lead on a couple of things that, that could be promising, but it's early days, early days on that front. Interesting. Uh, one more question from, uh, from Zoom. Um, uh, I presume uh, Professor Tiawari asked, uh, what about primary amides or simple, simple amines instead of acids? I presume as, as the substrate similar to uh, Professor Golders, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, certainly something that we're, we're thinking about. Um, we just haven't, haven't gotten there yet. Um, I think amides, so I have a, a couple preliminary results for the amides. And what's interesting is that we actually see, depending on the amide um, that we use, what's on the nitrogen, we see a mixture of 5-exo and 6-endo cyclization products from the, the activation step. And so that's pretty exciting and very, very interesting. Um, we do see cyclization via the nitrogen, not the oxygen. Um, but we're, we're intrigued to see if we can tune that reduce again, based on what's on the nitrogen. Um, but we have to get it under control because right now we're getting sort of one-to-one -one mixtures of the two. Um, and that's, that's probably what Andres is going to move on to next. The primary amines gets a little bit trickier just because those react very, uh, very readily with the uh, NHBI. And so we may end up getting the same products, but it's probably going to go via a different pathway. Um, so that's just going to, we envision that's going to be a little bit more complicated. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe um, uh, a few from, from YouTube. Uh, I'll do um, one from Nassim Khan. Uh, he asked, have you tried aliphatic? Oh, wait, this might be the same questions. Oh, no, not quite. Have you tried aliphatic tertiary amines such as triethylamine? Um, what would happen if TA is used instead of pyridine to substitute any other nucleophiles to make different derivatives? Substitute other. So um, activation of something like an alkyl tertiary amine. So once that does a ligand exchange on the, um, on the iodine center, you can think about just a simple alpha elimination, oxidizing that up to the imine. Um, and that's a pretty common pathway once you get amine ligation onto, a nit onto the iodine center. Uh, so, you know, but that's, that's also a competing pathway with, with oxygen. So the, the area we've thought about amines the most is with our ring expansion chemistry, if you could use the nitrogen there instead of an, uh, an alcohol. And uh, that's something that, that we're also interested in. We've kind of moved away from the ring expansion chemistry right now. Um, I just don't have enough hands to explore everything we want to do. Um, the question with nitrogen just gets a little bit more complicated because uh, radical pathways start to compete in pretty readily. So N-centered radicals and generating those under Suarez type conditions or, or even just ambient conditions is a lot easier than the corresponding oxygen. And so our initial forays into that were not nearly as successful as we were expecting them to maybe be. And so it got tabled for a little bit in, in the effort of other pursuits.